<coughs> Thank you all very much uh, for coming uh, to the seminar today. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here with you all. And it's always great to be able to talk about uh, a topic that is so close to one's heart. And, and I'm talking here about uh, embodiments of culture and identity. Um, so um, for me, it's um, almost autobiographical and almost like a personal anthropology when I'm looking at uh, step dancing in Ireland um, in the sense that um, I come from Ireland. <laughs> you can hear my Irish accent. Um, I come from the south of Ireland. And um, I come from uh, an Irish traditional music uh, song and dance background uh, where my father was a traditional musician, singer, dancer. And my grandmother was a traditional musician, singer, and dancer. Uh, and I was sent uh, to learn uh, classical music. I did my undergraduate degree in classical music. And I ended up um, doing a doctoral in, in dance and ethnochoreology at Laban here in London. And I worked as a collector of Irish traditional music, uh, song and dance for a museum called Muckers House in Killarney in Kerry. And I will be referring to that as well in this particular presentation today. So embodiments of culture and uh, identity. And to me, it's something that is, as I said, very pertinent at the moment because a lot of interest in the notion of embodiment and in the notion of identity, even though identity has been there for quite a long, long time, but um, embodiment since both the 1980s, 90s. Um, I talk about step dancing as a powerful tool of embodiment and meaning that provokes important questions relating to culture and identity through the bodies of those who perform it. So in other words, when we look at dance, when we look at people performing, it provokes questions. We ask, what does this mean? What is it about? And what does it mean to the people performing? And what does it mean to the people watching? What does it mean to people who know a lot about it? What does it mean to people who may not know an awful lot about it? But we're looking at meaning, and meaning for whom? And then the notion of, again, identity. What kind of an identity? Has it got to do with personhood? Has it got to do with self-identity, local identity, regional identity, community identity, national identity, global identity? What kind of identity are we talking about? We talk about imagined communities, etc. So sometimes it's that whole question of what do we mean when we talk about identity? Um, the other um, uh, quotation I have here is step dancing through time has assisted to shape and has been shaped by changing notions of culture and identity. So here I'm looking at step dancing through time uh, has assisted to shape and has been shaped by notions of culture and identity. So in other mm. words, there's a historicity here. So in other words, I'm talking about the whole notion of when you look at dance, it may mean <laughs> something at a particular point in time, but it changes. And that's the one thing we can be guaranteed of. Dance will change, culture will change. Identity changes, everything changes, everything is mobile. So you're looking at, from my point of view, looking at the dance, I have to look at it always in context. I have to look at a particular point in time, in a particular place, and that informs our notions of, our understanding of culture and identity. So embodiment, when I'm looking at embodiment, I'm looking at it as a subject of culture. And I'm influenced here very much by Tom Sordas, um, the medical anthropologist, where he looks at the body as the subject of culture. And that to me is very important as a dancer coming from within a particular culture. Uh, talking about dance, I find it hard to divorce it from my experience as a dancer. So it's always the two for me. It's always about the practice, the embodiment, and also about the theorizing around that and the knowledge that that produces because embodiment can produce knowledge. So embodiment is an indeterminate methodological field defined by perceptual experience and mode of presence and engagement in the world. And that again is something that I look at throughout the book that I, I wrote, looking at how one experiences dance in the world and how one engages in a dance form in the world. And how does that influence one's perception of the world and one's worldview? Um, I was also influenced by habitus, the whole notion of uh, uh, durable, transposable dispositions imposing the body over time. So you're looking at uh, codes of practice that have been encoded, that have been cultivated over time, but are not uh, stuck in place. Again, these are very much um, transposable and 
they are mobile. So it's not again in place. But again, that notion of habitus, I was looking at individual habitat, I was looking at community habitat, national habitat, etc. So what does it mean to people when they take part in a dance practice with other people? What do we share? And what do we not share? You know? And how can we identify ourselves within a group that has a particular habitat? Uh, Heidegger was also someone who influenced me, philosophically speaking, the notion of being in the world. And how does dance influence our own understandings of being in the world? How does it shape our understanding of being in the world? And as I said, I'm interested also in interrelationships. So embodiment is the starting point for me for analysing human participation in a cultural world. So lots of dance anthropologists or anthropologists, sociologists, have looked at the notion of embodiment. And I'm naming just a few here, like, uh, like Ness, Novak, Browning, Daniel, Sklar, Royce, and the recent publication uh, by Dankford and David, their edited volume. So lots of interest in dance and in embodiment. And as Royce would say, we cannot get to the heart of the place without committing ourselves to embodied ways of knowing to which access may be only through a body that holds its insights tight. Now that notion of embodied ways of knowing, that is again tied up with that whole notion of knowledge. What do we understand to be knowledge? And, you know, sometimes people think in the Western world up to quite recently that knowledge was academic knowledge. And there was, um, hierarchy there because academic knowledge was seen as important the word was seen as important whereas knowledge of the body was not as seen as as important whereas today all of us here in this room <laughs> uh, would be in agreement that knowledge of the body is extremely important and producing knowledge uh, through our bodies is very important so again from the book i was speaking about the body is socially and culturally constructed and it's through the body that we experience culture and reality. The body is therefore a field of both perception and practice and is tool, object and agent. It allows us to experience, sense, feel, perceive, communicate and express our notions of culture and reality, which simultaneously allows us to shape culture and reality. Culture is grounded in the human body and is embodied in dance. And in this instance, in my work in step dance, it is grounded in step dance. So interrelationships to me are important because dance does not exist in a vacuum. Uh, so you, you can look at dance on its own. You can do an analytical study of dance on its own. You can uh, abstract it, you can take it as text. You can analyze it as a text, like you would with a Beethoven sonata. You can do that, you can take the score and you can analyze it for form. Morphologically, you can do that. Uh, look how transpositions take place. The exact same with a dance. You document a dance, be it in a lab notation, whatever, you can take it as text and you can analyze it for a particular purpose, which could be for morphological reasons or whatever. But if we want to look at dance sociologically <laughs> or anthropologically, you have to look at it within the context of culture. And that's why it's the interrelationships between any human movement practice, the culture out of which it is merged, history, and to me, identity and culture are very close. And when I'm looking at history here, I'm not always talking about written history. I'm also talking about oral histories. I'm talking about histories of people who may not be represented. I might be talking about marginalized peoples. So therefore, oral history to me, as well as written histories, is important. And that includes archival work as well. So step dancing, <coughs> if, you, if you look at step dancing, it, um, which is what I'm here to talk about today, it has um, a history going back some 250 years. And it has changed since that time and today. And you ask, well, how has it changed? Why has it changed? What are the circumstances in any society that brings about change? Does the dance bring about change? Do the dancers as active social agents bring about change? Or is it the culture out of which people have come? Is it the culture and the circumstances? be they political, social, economic, or whatever, is it that that brings about change in the dance? And that's what any researcher will look at. It could be one, it could be the other, it could be both, combination of the two. So I look at um, different circumstances in Ireland. So I'm looking at colonialism, 
because uh, you have to look at colonialism when you're looking at step dancing in Ireland. Uh, I look at nationalism, uh, cultural nationalism particularly. I look at post-colonialism, and I look at globalization and transnationalization. So these are areas that um, influence step dancing and its development. So looking at colonialism, um, Ireland has um, a history of colonialism for 800 years. And very important um, for the development of step dancing was the civilizing process, which uh, Norbert Elias wrote beautifully about, looking at the history and the theory of manners from medieval times. And again, that notion of manners, the notion of etiquette, was very important in Ireland as it was elsewhere in Europe especially coming out of France, the dancing master tradition there, professional dancing masters, the culture of the courts, etiquette of the ballroom. And it didn't stop with that uh, hierarchy because it made its way down to what I would call labouring and peasant society in other areas of Europe. And Ireland was one of these areas. So the European dancing masters um, influenced the teaching of dance in Ireland. And that teaching of dance would have included, uh, going back to the 18th century minuets, it would have included country dances, it would have included quadrilles, but it also included step dancing as a solo dance genre. It was dan dancing masters, itinerant dancing masters, who, um, they were called itinerants because they travelled um, around the countryside teaching step dancing, but they were influenced by the European dancing masters in the sense that how one held oneself, one's deportment, how one treated others, one's behaviour in the ballroom or in a kitchen <laughs> mattered. It mattered sociologically and it mattered psychologically. Itinerant dancing masters were in Ireland at the lowest rung of the dancing master ladder. There are three or four different types of dancing masters. At the very top, you had dancing masters who, living in Dublin, um, work living with a lot of Anglo-Irish people living in Dublin because for uh, 500 years, England uh, ruled Ireland. Ireland was the colony of England. And that's for some people who might not know that here. And you found that a lot of English people who owned the land in Ireland would have lived in Dublin. They may not have lived in the lands that they owned. So they'd rent out their apartments, wherever in Dublin, and they lived the life of English men, English women in Dublin. So the dances they would have learned would have been the quadrilles and the country dances. And they'd have had their balls and their assembly rooms as well. And they had schools of dance and they taught people how to dance and prepare people for the balls. But in rural areas, in the local towns, you may have had dancing masters who said they were trained in France. <laughs> and had learned from French dancing masters, but that was to promote themselves and their job. That was not necessarily true. But you had itinerant dancing masters who, as I said, were at the lowest rung of the ladder. And these were people who taught to dance to agricultural communities in rural areas, in particularly the south of Ireland. My work in the 1980s, 1980, was to collect the step dances from the last of these itinerant dancing masters. His name was Jeremiah Molno, and um, his years are there, the very bottom, <laughs> 1881 to 1965. I did not meet Molno. He was dead by the time uh, I went in, in 1980. But I was fortunate in the sense that I was able to learn from the students, the remaining students of Jeremiah Molno. So for me, it was uh, a matter of uh, trying to document the history trying to document uh, everything to do with the culture out of which this dance had come, but also <coughs> trying to feel the dances. So I apprenticed myself to the dancers, and I learned. I learned from these uh, students, these dancers who had learned from Jeremiah Molno. So for me, that was very important because it gave me a link through my body to the history of the dancing masters in that particular area. And I was very aware of the fact that I could never dance like them, like these older dancers. First of all, they were much older than I was. Secondly, they did a different training to me. And my own training had been in competitive step dance, <laughs> even though my father had been a traditional dancer. So I was aware of both sides of the coin. I was aware of um, what Hoberg may talk about, the first existence, second existence. And the first existence being 
where that tradition carries on as a living tradition within a particular community. And the second existence in his estimation was something like a revival. And step dancing in competitive culture was like a revival. Okay, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So I had access in a strange way to both of these worlds. So embodiment, learning the dances, physically putting myself through it, because uh, I wanted to feel what do these movements that they learned from this dancing master, how do they feel in my body? And how could I get myself into the movements that they were actually doing? And how was it different to the dance form that I had learned physically in my body? How did I feel when I connected with that floor? Was it different or was it the same? How was my body? Was the torso the same or was it not? And I can tell you now, it was not the same. So this is a genealogy of dancing masters. And this uh, dancing master here, Okarine, he is the man who is, everybody acknowledges in the history as the person who systematized step dancing. And he was probably the most important of a number of dancing masters at the time. But his is the name that lives on. <laughs> and he is the guy who was credited. Um, the other dancing masters were the people who came before Jeremiah Molno. And again, all of these were within living memory of the dancers that I would have interviewed. This is a photograph of Jeremiah Molno um, here on the right hand side with one of the dancers I learned from, uh, Sheila Lines Boulder, when she was uh, an older lady. So that was around 1938. And it was in Listow, a little town in North Kerry, and it was a fair day. And you had um, a pipe band playing in the background. So it's not a traditional music group in the background, it's a pipe band. But Molno just took Sheila's hand and started walking, and then they later did a reel together. But it's, a con it's the only photograph of this dancing master, Jeremiah Molno. And the interesting thing is the person who took the photograph, uh, Buddy Trant, she took this photograph because Sheila was her friend. She was not taking the photograph of the dancing master at all. She was really wanting to take the photograph of her friend. It was our good fortune that he happened to be standing next to her. Um, these are three of the dancers of the older Molno dancers. So it's a traditional style of dance, very much close to the floor style of dance. Um, so I'll try and show a bit of that now if I can. Mm. But they loved talking about dance together, so there were lots of uh, stories that they would have had. Um, and they talked about not just steps, but who they got the step from. They knew the history of the steps. They knew what made steps different. And each one of them knew as well who, like an ownership, an informal ownership of step dances. So in other words, if somebody created a variation, you wouldn't really copy that variation. You wouldn't imitate it, because it didn't say very much about your creativity. But you realize that this variation was their step and their variation. It was almost like a signature for the particular dancer. The other thing that you should notice there is the notion of them holding hands, uh, the three elderly men holding hands together. Now, that was very typical in this area in North Kerry. So if there were women there, if there were men there, they held hands as in community, okay, holding each other up. And particularly um, uh, as they got older, especially the man in the, in the middle there, he needed the support because um, he wouldn't have got to the end really without the support of his friends. So embodiment of culture, history and identity, um, that to me is important. What does it say about that performance when I'm looking at it? What is the culture that they reference? And that to me was an important question. Um, how can I understand the dance? And to me to understand that dance, uh, to try to understand that culture of which it had come. And again, it was a rural uh, culture, agricultural communities who performed. Um, so when they danced, when they performed, they did so on social occasions, generally. And there were many social occasions in rural Ireland uh, at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. So they had performed at crossroad dances, that had performed in homes of people. Um, I talk a lot about mutual aid. Mutual aid system was very important in Kerry for poor people. So in other words, if you weren't doing well around Christmas time and you didn't have much money, you found that people would hold a dance in a house and the money they collected at the door would go to the poor family for, for Christmas. So mutual aid was very important to them. Um, also the notion of the localized regional dance music activity as as understanding place. 
to me, it's almost like looking at dancing the place and placing the dance. It's the, the notion that it's only through movement that we actually understand the notion of place. Otherwise, it's a building, bricks and mortar. It becomes special, it becomes memorable when people participate within these specific spaces. So they're no longer just a place. It becomes a place with specific meaning and meaning for these dancers. And the dance can sometimes construct that wonderful sense of space and a social sense of space. Also, the notion of knowledge to me was very important because I knew uh, the knowledge that these people had was very interesting for me. And it was different to the knowledge that I'd had as a trained step dancer. So in other words, my la the lab notation I did, I did a lot of lab notation, I did that because I wanted to be able to show that there were specific new movements within their system and that they put movements together in a way that made sense to them and to the culture out of which they had come. So it wasn't putting any movements that you felt like putting together. They put certain movements together to make up motifs that had meaning for them and their culture. So they had a knowledge and I was really interested in documenting that in love notation. Because when I came in first, I was asked to preserve a declining step dance tradition. And you can't preserve a tradition. It's impossible, you could not do it. So what could you do? And the best thing you could do really is give people the vocabulary, give them the grammar, give them the syntax, and show them how the people whose tradition it is, how do they use it? In other words, how do they speak their tradition? How do they dance their tradition? And that's what I did in, in this, to give me an idea of that culture out of which they had come. The notion of style was very important to them. I'm talking about individual style, how people put style into a step, how they coloured a step, and how they put their mark on a step. And there was a lovely saying this to say to me that they would write with their feet. So they go kind of a... This notion of the ankle and putting it on the ground. And to me, there was a sense of earthiness to this dance, a very much a close to the floor style to the dance. Land as well was very important uh, to these people. They had been deprived land, particularly through the, the colonial period. They couldn't own land. When they eventually got land, it became extremely important. So that earth was important to them. And when you look at that culture, and now I'm going to look at how it changed and why it changed at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. And other reasons also, there was a famine, the Great Famine in Ireland, uh, 1845 to 1849. And in that famine, there was 8.5 million on the island. And after the famine, there were 6.5 million. So 1 million died and 1 million emigrated. So there were, the population was much smaller. But that affected the dance as well. For instance, the dancing masters I showed you earlier, Maureen, that dancing master, you know, he earned a living as a dancing master prior to the famine. And he earned a decent living prior to the famine. After the famine, he died in a workhouse. And he died, he was buried in a pauper's grave, even though he had been a dancing master. He succeeded in teaching the dance to others, but, it had lost the impact it had. Before the famine, ballroom etiquette was important. Before the famine, manners was very important. Courtesy, bringing somebody out onto the dance floor. After the famine, nobody taught etiquette of the ballroom anymore. It was not something people were interested in anymore. After that, it became the dance and training in the dance. Okay? So looking at the end of the 19th century, um, this has got to do with cultural nationalism in Ireland and Ireland trying to gain independence from England. And there were many attempts throughout the centuries trying to gain independence, but it would come at the beginning of the 20th century. So in 1893, you had the cultural nationalist movement, the Gaelic League, which was set up to promote the Irish language as the spoken language of the people of Ireland. Um, the Irish language, um, uh, was slowly <laughs> declining since the 17th century. And after the famine, um, again, many people with the Irish language, some of them would have emigrated, some would have died, but as well as that, there were middle class people in Ireland who were aspiring to speak the English language, because the English language was seen as 
the higher language, the more important language. The Irish language was seen as the language really of the poor of Ireland. So there were these connotations going on as well. So you found that in the 19th century, it was the silent century, they called it. And you found as well that um, at the end of the 19th century, the, the Gaelic League decided, intellectuals within the Gaelic League decided that they wanted to bring the Irish language back as the spoken language of the people. And from that <coughs> point of view, they set up a league and they set up classes where they would teach people to speak the language. And they also set up classes in dance and in music. And they set up competitions. And competitions they felt would motivate people um, to improve, to better themselves. And the Gaelic League um, was very important because it was very successful. You had branches, hundreds of branches all over Ireland, thousands. They were in America, they were in Australia. They weren't just in Ireland, they were also in the diaspora. And what was important for the Gaelic League at the time was to establish what is it to be Irish? That was the question at the time. What is it to be Irish? You know, we're not English, we're Irish. So what, is th what does that mean? We speak English, <laughs> you know, we are behaving like English people, but we're not English people. So how are we going to show that we're not? How are we going to show that we are actually Irish? And that was the question. So it was this whole notion of binary oppositions was very important at the time. Um, it's like Derrida's violent hierarchies, the low become high, the high become low. And here they were looking at what is it to be Irish and what is it to be non-Irish? Um, and it had moral, immoral implications. And this had to do with a Christian faith as well, because you must remember in Ireland it was a, um, a Catholic country and, um, and Catholicism would have been very supportive of the Gaelic League at the time. So if they were looking at morality, it would have been a Catholic Christian morality. They were looking at what does it mean to be Irish in an authentic way <laughs> and an inauthentic way. And they look at notions of pure. Now, what is it to be pure Irish or what is it to be innovative? And if you're innovative, how innovative can you be for it to be no longer considered Irish? Or can you still be innovative and it's still considered to be Irish? And then the notion of tradition and the notion of modern. Now, what is all of that? So these were all the questions that came up for them at the time. And they were looking for um, the, anything to do with the Irish language and the traditional way of life with rural people. That's what they elevated, that way of life. So the thing is, the Irish language they promoted, they promoted uh, literature in the Irish language, they promoted traditional dance, traditional song, traditional music. And they set up events that would help them to promote that. So, um, did I do that right? Oh yeah. So, so what you found with the dance, it became an important social and an ideological tool, okay? Now, they selected dances. It wasn't any dance could be performed uh, under the auspices of the Gaelic League. The Gaelic League wanted Irish dances. So they had to decide what are Irish dances. So they decided quadrilles are not Irish dances. So set dancing, which would have come from Europe, could not be danced at any event run by the Gaelic League because they were regarded as foreign and were not Irish. So step dancing was regarded as Irish, <laughs> even though it had been influenced by dancing masters, but was still regarded, they, they didn't want to go there. <laughs> so they regard that as being Irish because it was associated with dancing masters, itinerant dancing masters, and people had a memory of dancing masters in the past. So there was a continuity with the past. So they felt they needed something to build the nation upon. They needed ideas, they needed ideologies, they needed cultural practices, they needed the language. So they built it on step dancing and Cayley dancing. They set up stage competitions with live musicians. Uh, a fesh means a festival. Uh, and it's a competition, a fesh is a competition in dance or in music. And usually had summer sports events. And an erachtus, erachtus here is an assembly or a bigger competitive event. Okay, so fesh would be a smaller event and an erachtus was the bigger event. So the Irish language, Irish language literature, all of these were supported and developed. Irish manufacture was also promoted by the Gaelic League. So in other words, if you were a dancer back then, your, the, the, the outfit you wore had to be made of Irish materials, okay? They could not be made from any other kinds of materials. So they wanted to promote um, materials, etc., from Ireland, so that whole industry. On Clive Solish is the magazine that the Gaelic League brought out, and they had vocabulary 
uh, published in it. They had songs published in it. They had reports from Gaelic League branches published in it. It was something that everybody had. And the Gaelic League was a middle class organization. It was the intellectuals. And these were the people who wanted to be the leaders of the people of Ireland. So the Clive Solish was its magazine, meaning the sword of light uh, in the English language. This is a photograph of one of these early fashions in the 1920s uh, by the Gaelic League. And what you can see is a stage, a platform erected in a field. Okay? And the dancers will compete here on this stage. And you have the musicians sitting here and you have the adjudicators at the other side of that stage. And here are all the people around. It's a Sunday because they're wearing their Sunday best. So you know that they're not working, they're all there. So that's an idea of um, what the fesh looks like. Generally, these were at sports events. So you could have children um, after these competitions that could take part in just racing, running, jumping, <laughs> anything like that. But there were sports events. And the language throughout these events was the Irish language. English was not spoken at these events. It was all Irish. Um, the nation state, post-coloniality. Here you had schools of Irish dancing being set up. Um, and the schools uh, of Irish dancing were going to be very different to the schools of dance that had been there with the dancing masters. The itinerant dancing masters, their schools lasted six weeks. After six weeks, they moved on to the next location. After six weeks again, they moved on again somewhere else. They were moving, they were mobile. And you know, if students wanted to get more tuition, they had to travel to the dancing master. But generally, like the old men that were dancing on the video a few minutes ago, they had six weeks tuition. And after that, they learned from neighbors down the road, or they learned from other people that they'd meet who'd have a step, and they perfected it themselves through practice and through performing with musicians at informal contexts, okay? Social contexts. The dancing schools set up by the Gaelic League were different. These were set up in cities, in the towns of Ireland, because there you had organization by the Gaelic League was much stronger than it would have been in rural areas, okay? Uh, another difference with these schools is that they were now going to be in permanent places, in a town, in a city. They'd have a hall, they'd have a room in a hall where they would teach, and they'd teach maybe two or three times a week, okay? And they taught younger people, and the younger people were generally from the ages of three or four <laughs> up to about maybe 18. And these schools were interesting because <coughs> um, I was I'm even interviewing people at the moment and uh, you know a lot of people a lot of boys wouldn't have done a lot of Irish dancing you know because they'd have felt ridiculed um, for dancing because in the cities it was seen as effeminate and some of them were bullied in school so some gave up but those who really really loved it <laughs> stayed on and they were able to tolerate the bullying but in these schools of dance in the city. It was interesting because students at a very young age, they embodied what it was to be an Irish dancer. And it was in a very progressive way. So if you were dancing three times a week for 10 years or 12 years or 15 years, depending on how long, you embodied what the Gaelic League decided was Irish culture and what it was to be an Irish dancer. And the notion of Irish dancing only came in with the Gaelic League. The old men I recorded, they didn't call it Irish dancing. They called it traditional dancing or just dancing, simply dancing. It was the only dance they knew. They didn't choose between contemporary dance, ballet and Irish dance and tap, or Bratanati and whatever. They did it because that's all that was available to them. It was their dancing. But when the Gaelic League set it up, it became Irish dancing. You know, even when I was going to dance class, I just, I'd say I'm going dancing. You know, because that was the class we went to, just dancing. So the gender changed as well. With the dancing masters, it was predominantly males. The dancing masters were predominantly males. The people I collected from in the 1980s, predominantly males, mostly men. I had a number of women, but they were mostly men. With the Gaelic League and the schools of dance, that changed. It was mostly young girls who did Irish dancing in the cities. And, and one of the reasons I felt for this was because the Gaelic Athletic Association, which was another uh, nationalist organization set up in 1883 in Ireland, that organization had set up sports for young children, such as hurling and Gaelic football. So a lot of guys had the choice between you either go dancing or you do hurling or football. 
whereas that choice wasn't really there for girls. Do you know? For the girls, the Irish dancing was very important. And another thing about the Irish dancing class was that it was affordable to the vast majority of people. Uh, you found then throughout the, the 20th century, and these schools were set around the 1920s in the cities, and from the 1920s, 30s and 40s, you had costume development, shoe development, and development in the, the notion of the dances that could be performed or not performed. A lot of the dances, the solo dancing was left up to the teachers. You know, a lot of the solo dancing was up to the teachers to create. The teachers were constantly creating new material for dancers, depending on the ability of the dancers. When it came to the group dances, Cayley dances, figure dances, those were prescribed. And the organization produced a booklet, a textbook, which had about 30 dances. And these were the 30 dances, like the Bible. There were 30 dances that everybody who was a teacher registered with the organization on commission with the Gaelic League, they knew these dances. And if you were participating in competitions, these were the dances you performed. These were the dances that you were measured against others in. These are photographs of the 1930s, what they wore. So they're wearing a very simple class costume. The guys I collected from in North Kerry, they didn't wear costumes. They wore their every ordinary, ordinary wear, Sunday wear as it were. But here now you have costumes. And a lot of the costumes around the 1920s and 30s, they were saffron, they were green, they were bonine, they were the colour of the flag of Ireland. Okay? Because green became the colour for Ireland, the national colour for Ireland. Like the harp became the national symbol of Ireland as a musical instrument. So here you found that in these days, uh, the girls and sometimes the guys might wear their medals, what they won, to show off to people what they won. People don't do that anymore. But that was in the, the 1920s. And um, what you see here is a four-hand reel, you know, because four people stand together. It's a Cayley dance that they would be performing. Uh, the Commission um, is an organization that was set up in the 1930s, 1929, 30. It's on Commission Le Rinke it, it's in English called the Commission, and that organization is still in existence today, and it's the biggest international organization of Irish step dance. So it set up rules and regulations uh, to do with competitions that they ran. And some of these rules and regulations said that if you're a teacher, and if you want your students to compete in any of our competitions, then you must be registered with us. So a lot of teachers registered with the organization. And once you register with the organization in those days, it was a big commitment because the Gaelic League said, if you do Irish dancing and you were a teacher with us, you cannot take part in any other kind of dancing. Okay, so you couldn't uh, do the foxtrot. <laughs> you couldn't do waltzing. You had to do Irish dancing. And there was the same thing was in sport. If you were in the Gaelic Athletic Association, and you did hurling and Gaelic football, well, you wouldn't be able to do soccer or rugby or anything like that because they were seen as foreign, okay? And um, so a lot of teachers, like my own teacher, she would have lived through this, you know? And she remembers not being able to go to other dancing with her friend because she was an Irish step dancer. So they expected total commitment. So the registration of teachers, registration of adjudicators, uh, and there was a whole monopoly on this. So if you belonged, you could go to these competitions. If you didn't belong, you couldn't go to these competitions. You couldn't win an All-Ireland, for instance. So you couldn't prove you were an All-Ireland dancer if your teacher didn't belong to this organization. So teachers felt a lot of pressure to belong to the organization. Also, they wanted to see what were the new developments in the dance. And they wanted to keep up with trends in the dance. So a lot of people felt better to be in than out. They also institutionalized a canon of dances, like a national canon, which is what I spoke about a few minutes ago, like the book called Orinka Forna, which is the uh, Irish um, dance book that they produced in 1943, 1969, 1939. And there was a whole notion of uh, a hegemony being involved here, in the sense that there was a whole lot of uh, the Gaelic League, the Commission set itself up as an authority in Irish dance. They were dictating 
what was Irish dance, what was not Irish dance, what you could do in competition, what you would not do in competition. They set up grades in competition. They set up age groups in competition. So you were either dancing under six, under eight, under 10, under 12, under 14. You were a junior, you were a senior. You were either competing sometimes in male competitions, sometimes in female competitions, um, in more rural competitions. It was not divided according to gender. Okay, but in the bigger competitions they did because they had a notion of what was a male way of dancing <laughs> and a notion of what is a female way of dancing. And that was very much part of cultural nationalism at the time where there was a heteronormative understanding of what is um, going to be promoted here as part of cultural nationalism. And it was the nuclear family, you know, the nuclear family where you have male and females, head of the family and your children. And, and that was what they wanted to promote. And the dancing was the same. They promoted couples and all the dancing, male, female. And if there wasn't male, female, let's say in, in a forehand reel, like a male and a female and a male and a female, like the photograph I have there, uh, four women would dance together. But rarely would you get four men dancing together. There's a beautiful clip on YouTube with two guys dancing together. And it's really fantastic. It's really very beautiful. I'll have to send you the, the clip to that. But in comp that was outside of competition. That was for exhibition purposes. But in competition, they didn't really want males dancing together. They had to be with women. So there was a lot of control with the organization, controlling what one danced. Like, for instance, there's a dance called the slip jig. Males weren't really allowed to dance the slip jig in competition because it's a graceful dance. And they felt to be too effeminate for guys to do this dance. They would teach men that, they would teach boys that dance at about the age of five, six, uh, so as they'd acquire grace of movement. But after that, they wouldn't be doing it anymore. Okay? Um, I'll show you, if I have time later, I'll show you a bit of this. It's a, a competitive, well, I'll see if I can get onto it. I'm not sure if I will. Is it going to come up? Yes. Mm. Is it? It's going to take time, I think, going across. Yeah. This is the bit we didn't get to practice. But anyway, this clip, um, which may come, may not come, it's a school of dance in Dublin, the McCarthy School of Dance in Dublin. And it's very interesting because um, they're doing um, a figure dance, a figure dance called the Tower Brooch. And a figure dance is a dance that's choreographed by a teacher. OK? It's not prescribed. It is choreographed by a teacher. And uh, it can be in real time, and it can be in jig time, either real or jig time. And here it's 1968, and they're performing on a television program and it's it's a very interesting clip because you'll see the style of the dance and the way the perform and the attitude to time and the attitude to the body and, and i think it's very interesting um stylistically speaking if we have the chance to see it yeah i think we'll have to come back to it i'm afraid me really? i'm just, just not sure if you're Network's working. Okay, okay, you go off so. Yeah, sorry about that. Did I get out that or just just do the middle one and we can just close it down. Okay, we'll come, come back later. Pipe, might pipe mm. out again. Waited until here, wasn't it? Is that that's not it all? Isn't no, it? that's here. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay. So I'll show it later, it's just um, a bit late. So the notion of the training of Irish dancers from a very young age until the age of whatever, 18, 19, 20, not every dance. Dancers, um, what you must realize in these dance schools is that some dancers, if they start at three and four, they might stop at 13, 12 or 13. Because in those days, people felt that, well, you have enough Irish dancing now, so uh, you, pro you can concentrate now on your academic studies. Um, it was a pastime. Whereas for other dancers like myself, we really loved it which meant you were not going to give up at 30. So you continued, you know, until you were about 18. And then you probably gave up competition because that was it. You know, for people like me at 18, you continued to dance then after that because you liked to perform. And you did your TCRG in Irish dance because you wanted to teach, okay? And you became qualified as an Irish dance teacher. But discipline was very important. So the one thing, and other dancers and other dance forms recognize that as well, the whole notion of training at a very young age 
and doing it for years upon years upon years. So it produces subjected and practiced bodies. And as Foucault talked about, I'm sure many of you are looking at this here, docile bodies or docility. And Ness would talk about the kinds of dance that have attracted the label classical are the most tradition bound, technically developed and hierarchically institutionalized varieties of dance. Now I put Irish competitive step dance in with this here. It says such dance John typically require a relatively great quantity of practice in order for students to acquire mastery. And training for the most advanced levels also tend to begin at a very young age. So that mastery, so when you heard people say that somebody was a beautiful dancer or a great dancer or a lovely dancer or whatever, they had mastery of their craft, whatever it was about, okay? But that notion of discipline, uh, that notion of training was very much embodied in dancers within that competitive dance arena. And it still is to this day. So embody embodiment of cultural politics. So here, when you're looking at competitive step dance, when you're looking at the commission, when you're trying to place competitive step dance within a cultural context, you're talking about the establishment of the Irish nation state. So although the Gaelic League was set up in 1893, it was working towards establishing Ireland as a culturally different culture to England. That's what it set out to do. It was called a de-Anglicization process. And it was trying to promote aspects of Irish culture. The Irish nation state came about in 1922. That was many years later, okay? So the dancers, unknowingly, they would perform the nation when they performed at these events run by the Gaelic League. Dancers weren't aware of it, uh, like I wasn't aware of it. We danced because we loved to dance. But it was a very effective tool, ideological tool for the Gaelic League. Also was talking about the community habitats, which is like the nation as a community, or looking at an imagined community like Benedict Anderson would you talk about. But that notion of the nation of community was definitely felt by Irish dancers. Whenever you went to an All-Ireland Championship, whenever you went to big competitions, you met people, everybody who reached a particular standard was at this event. And you knew these people. So in some ways, you never got to meet them all, not all the dancers, because not all the dancers could get to these All-Ireland Championship events, because again, it was, you know, you, com you competed at regional level, local level, and finally national level, today at international level. But the point is, it was this notion of the politics of the dance and how you embody that politics when you dance. But the dancer's experience, as I said, was very different. We saw it as challenging physically. Uh, you saw it as uh, cultural heritage. You saw it as part of your heritage. The music was part of your heritage. The dance was part of your heritage. You didn't separate the two. It was a music dance complex. Uh, it was social, which is extremely important. The aspect that you went and you met your friends and you went to dance class, you went to competitions, you met other friends and other people you knew. You wanted to see what are people doing now. It was a wonderful event to go and see what was actually going on. But the competitive context, again, it, you know, it has pros and cons. You know, it can motivate people to perform. Uh, it can prepare people for the competitive world <laughs> in which we live. But it, it, it can also be stressful. And it can put a lot of pressure on people. But the majority of people who dance, what I would call the top of the game, they love it. And I mean they love it passionately and they can't live without it. They'd find it very hard to live without it because to them it is soulful and to them it's about expressing themselves physically to music that they actually love as well. I suppose I can't show this either. You all know river dance and again that's the notion of um, globalization and the notion that um, Ireland economically within very few decades went from almost a third world country to a first world country. And that's very interesting. In the 1990s, we were regarded as the third per capita richest country in the world, which was wonderful for a small nation state. Can't say the same today, but then it was. And the whole notion of Irish dance and the commodification of Irish dance had implications for the dance. It changed it. 
Nobody was to know when Riverdance went out in that Eurovision Song Contest, that interval in 1994, in April 1994, as part of that uh, intermission, that it was going to go anywhere. It was just put together as an interval act and put up there as part of the Eurovision Song Contest. The only thing was that 300 million people saw it. And because 300 million people saw it, it meant that the next day, when um, rock and roll kids <laughs> uh, was the Irish song that won the Eurovision Song Contest, on the charts the next day, rock and roll kids was number two. Number one was Riverdance, the sound track in Riverdance, that seven minute piece. So that was what encouraged them and motivated them to work and turning it into a show in 1995. Then they performed in Rwanda, then they started performing all over the world, then they started cloning it. So you had the lag and the lean and the liffy, different um, companies within Riverdance. Then you had um, companies that only worked weekends to enable students, university students, to, let's call it flying squad, to enable university students to go to college during the week and at weekends maybe perform in Germany or maybe perform in France or some other part of the world. So maybe some royal was giving a 21st birthday and he invited one to the Riverdance troupe to come and perform. So these are all the opportunities that people got within Riverdance. So the commodification of it, it was using the dance as a way of placing Ireland. Riverdance succeeded in placing Ireland globally because up to that point in time, a lot of people really didn't distinguish Ireland from England. Many people, because we spoke English anyway, and many people even thought the Irish language was a dialect of English, which it isn't, as you know. But the thing is, it did place Ireland globally, and people recognised the dance. And through the dance, they recognised the culture. And yes, the dance did change. It was not um, the costumes you saw earlier, the photograph I showed you of the 1930s. That was not the costume in River Dance. The costumes in River Dance were cut up shorter. They were lighter, expensive materials. The music was different. It was not reels, jigs and hornpipes. The music was composed, <coughs> newly composed music by Bill Whelan, and who had been very much influenced by East European rhythms, Bulgarian music. So all these influences came into the dance. And then you had lead performers, you know, what they call star performers, um, which we hadn't had before. Of course, we'd had ensemble pieces. Of course, we had dancers dancing together. But what we really didn't have was this um, very much rock and roll style of show, a very much popular show, and very much lead dancers at the front and the chorus line behind them. Now, we hadn't had that. And the way it was presented as well was not something we had in Ireland. But the attitude in Ireland was, it was great. People thought, you know, those people who knew Irish dance and who wanted to do something different with it saw this as had great potential. And if you read my article, Perceptions of Irish Dance, uh, you'll also have read the fact that some people, when they saw it first, didn't like it. Not everybody liked it. Some people thought, as I said, it was like um, an Irish version of dirty dancing. And older people thought it wasn't Irish dancing at all. Because older dancing to them was doing reels, jigs and hornpipes in a close to the floor style, like these older men. So when you look at what these older men were doing, and then you look at what they were doing in river dance, it's very different. But the culture had changed. The culture had changed. Circumstances had changed in Ireland. The economy had changed in Ireland. People in Ireland no longer saw themselves as being just Irish. They saw themselves as participating on the global stage. They saw themselves as being European. European and global individuals. Yes, we're Irish, but we're also cosmopolitans. And that's something that you need to be aware of when you're looking at a river dance. Also, the notion of professionalization of the dance. Up to that point in time, dancers, Irish dancers, didn't have many opportunities, you know, to dance professionally. They may have had chances to dance like I did. You dance with groups like the Chieftains, or you dance with groups like Mihal or Sulawan, etc. Uh, but you didn't have the opportunity um, to be a professional dancer. It was not there. You didn't have a choice. Today, dancers have a choice. You know, they can either decide to become a professional Irish dancer or not. And in those early years, those lead dancers, as professional dancers, were paid extremely well. I don't know if they're paid as well today, but they were paid extremely well then. 
And today it's... Sorry, I, I, don't, I won't need it, it's all right. But what you must look at, it, it, it was very much market driven, uh, River Dance, it was very much entrepreneurial and it was very much to do with the Celtic Tiger era in which Ireland was in at the time, economically doing extremely well and it reflected that. Another part of post-coloniality was the establishment of the MA in Irish traditional dance performance at the University of Limerick. I don't know if it would have been established without River Dance. Um, River dance came and people, you know, wanted to do more training in Irish dance. And the MA in Irish traditional dance at the University of Limerick, which I was able to design, was very much uh, in context. It was not to train river dancers, though. It was not at all to do with that. People would come from, and I talk here about the, the international student profile, and that to me was very interesting because it was not Irish, just people who were born in Ireland and the diaspora came to do this program. It was actually people from many different parts of the world who came to do it. So it became transnational. So you're talking about transnationalization. You're talking about people from Japan, people from Russia, people from Sweden, people from Australia, people from Eastern Europe, from the Nordic countries. They were coming to do this MA in Irish traditional dance performance. Equally, these cultures themselves and these societies were established their own Irish dance organizations. So you had organizations like the Commission in Dublin and you had many other organizations involved in Irish dance but the Commission was the main one, the biggest one internationally. But then you had people as well in countries like Sweden who wanted to do Irish dance. And if you're in Sweden, it's not like growing up in Ireland where you have an Irish dance teacher maybe down the road and you can go to your Irish dance teacher and maybe you have a choice of three or four teachers. In Sweden, in a place like that, you don't. So you have to travel to try and find a workshop, to try and find some Irish dancer who's giving a workshop. And a lot of the people giving the workshops came out of river dance. And it was a great kudos for these people. Um, if you could say, I dance with river dance, people wanted you to teach them. And probably if you didn't dance with river dance, you weren't see, seen as star quality. So being a dancer with river dance was important to get work for employment purposes. Um, the MA again, vocational reflexive practice. So it's all, um, it's about trying to get jobs <laughs> really at the end of the day for Irish dancers and not necessarily with the shows. Uh, it's trying to train Irish dancers to create work for themselves. So in other words, they are taught, for instance, choreographic principles and contemporary dance principles, but they also have to go deeper within and reflect upon their own practice. What are they doing? What are they about? They got to create theatrical solos. They got to work in ensembles. They've got to um, do things like choreography for camera. Lots of different things they do in order to allow them have different options in life. But while they're doing that, it is an MA in Irish traditional dance. So the thing is, there is advanced training in it. So in other words, they need to be up to date with everything that's going on in Irish dance at this point in time, this moment in time. But they also go back. They also got to go back to older styles, <laughs> like the, the people I learned from, the Molno dancers. Um, I would teach some of that to the students. They also learn dance styles like Chanos, uh, which is an improvisational um, dance form in Ireland. So some of these dancers come from competition culture because that's all they've been exposed to, competition culture. So the thing is, it's opening the mind and exposing them to different ways of moving, what's still regarded as Irish, <laughs> Irish dance. And that is, you know, that's an interesting question. When is it no longer Irish and when is it still Irish and how important is it for it to be regarded as being Irish? Because for many dancers at the top of their game, I don't know if they care anymore whether it's regarded as being Irish or not. It's the notion that they are Irish dancers, their training was in Irish dance, and they're taking that as a platform and they go further with it into whatever direction they wish to go into. But for them, it's to be respectful of where they've come from, where the tradition has come from. And I think if you're respectful of where it's come from, you will move with caution and care into the future. So that's the MA. And uh, as I said, it's international. And the culture, <laughs> as I said, is not just Irish. It's they're from anywhere and everywhere. I had a Japanese student who was a triathlete. And um, 
he saw a river dance in Tokyo and he decided there and then that that's what he was meant to do with his life, to be an Irish dancer. And he left Tokyo and he came and he did the audition for the MA. But he didn't have that background training, you know, and it's advanced training. So he didn't get it that time. And I wasn't really expecting to see him again. But three years later, he arrives back and he auditions again. And this time he gets in and he gets his MA and he goes back with Riverdance to Tokyo in Japan and he performs with him. Do you know, so that's a nice story of somebody who is not Irish. And the question, do you have to be Irish to do Irish dance? I would say, no, you don't have to be Irish to do Irish dance. It's a system, it's a practice that's there and it's open to anyone who's got the desire to dance in that particular way and is a particular way of dancing. So I hope the talk today has given you some indication of um, the, I suppose, the trajectory and the different ways of embodying Irish dance and the different ways that that impacts on our notions of identity <laughs> and who we are. And as you've seen the different representations of the dance, they say very different things about what Irish dance is or what it can be. Thank you. With the cultural nationalist movement uh, that set up uh, the Commission, you have teachers in the north of Ireland who belong to the Commission. I didn't get the chance to go into all of this in detail, but in 1969 there was another organisation that was set up and it was called the Kogol and it split from the Commission because it didn't want the, the cultural nationalist movement, the Gaelic League, dictating what they should do as dancers. So they wanted to run their own organisation and to develop Irish dance themselves without being under the influence of the Gaelic League and they became the Kogol. But around the same time, in the north of Ireland, th another organisation was established called the Festival Organisation of Northern Ireland and it was very much influenced by a woman called Patricia Mulholland. And Patricia Mulholland was um, a wonderful dance teacher and she was a fiddler and she used to play for her, her dancers herself and she choreographed some wonderful material and she was also interested in ballet. So she uh, established uh, the Irish Ballet in the north of Ireland. Um, so, but in, in around the 1972s, uh, she was asked to bring her dancers to perform for the Queen. And uh, the Commission wouldn't allow this. And they said, if you perform for the Queen, you'll no longer be in the organisation. So she performed for the Queen. <laughs> and, that's that, and that was one of the reasons, because she wanted to be able to do herself. She wanted to be able to dance wherever she wanted to dance, bring her students to dance wherever she wanted to dance. But bring up that whole notion of um, North of Ireland, it's very interesting because I suppose you've seen the film Dance Lexi Dance. It's a beautiful little film, Dance Lexi Dance. It got an award in the o Oscars, actually, for a very small little film. But it's very nice because you've got um, a Protestant father and he's, he's a lone father and a lone parent and he's got his daughter and the daughter sees river dance of course and she wants to become an Irish dancer but his main issue is we don't do that as a Protestant we don't do that so it became very much associated with Catholicism and the Republic of Ireland uh, and that's a shame really because as a dance form it belongs to the whole whole island and further afield now and, and it's the same with the language the Irish language. The Irish language would have been spoken on the whole island of Ireland. But again, the Irish language became equated with the Republic of Ireland. Uh, but today, it's great to see uh, organisations in the north of Ireland who are actually promoting the Irish language now themselves. And these include Protestant communities and Catholic communities. So that divide, I think, is in perceptions, how people perceive it and how they interpret it for their own agendas, wherever those agendas may be, political agendas, etc. But to me, um, I would welcome everybody doing it, but I asked that question to dancers in the North of Ireland before, how do they feel? Uh, do they feel it was a Catholic thing to do in the North of Ireland? And some people said to me it mattered in some places, in other places it didn't matter. And the interesting thing is some teachers taught Irish dance in orange order halls. And that to me was awfully interesting. So that notion of place and how it changes depending on the activity that happens there or what people make of it or how they construct a sense of place through the body, through movement. Remain true. <laughs>
what do you mean by true? What is true in that whole debate, going, you know, at the end of the, the 19th century about pure, what is pure, what do you understand? Like Ireland, as I said, had an 800 year colonization, but it was always encountering other cultures. Irish people were going abroad and people from abroad were always coming to Ireland. So that whole notion of what is Irish, what is not, um, I wouldn't be a person to define what it is and what it's not in the sense that it's many things. And you know, it hasn't just one identity, it has many, many, many identities in Ireland at the moment. And where it'll be in five years time, I don't know. Um, it depends on the people who are investing in Irish dance and the people who wanted to go somewhere, they will carry it, they will move it. And I think audiences and I think other people, um, they're always there critiquing. You know, in anything you do, there'll always be people who say we want innovation and you'll always have people who are the traditionalists. And, I, and the traditionalists will always want it to be the way it was. <laughs> and the innovators will always want to push the boundaries and go in another direction. And sometimes these two balance each other out. They do. So you have people who will always be trying to keep it and you'll have people who will always be trying to change. And you'll always have people who will be afraid of change and you'll always have people who welcome change. But I suppose the thing is not to be afraid because the most important thing is it's a living tradition. And a living <laughs> tradition means it will change. And for it to stay alive, it has to change. And whatever trajectory it takes, wherever it goes, the wonderful, the exciting thing is that it has, it's what I call the dynamicity of the form, the richness of the form, the fact that uh, organizations for political, economic, social purposes, whatever, they can take this form and they can do different things with it for different reasons. And it's still there and it'll continue to be there. And I don't know where it'll go in five years time or 10 years time, but I'll be delighted to see it develop, to grow, to live on. And that'll mean something to people. You know, that people still feel uh, passionate about what they do. <laughs> I think up to about the 1970s, uh, you know, so 80s, yes. It was, I think the change has happened faster now than they did. And that's thanks to technology and it's also thanks to the ease of transport where people go to, you know, these old men I showed, they competed too, there were competitions, but some decided they never wanted to compete. Some might have competed at one or two competitions in their lives, you know? Whereas today, there could be competitions every weekend. And people, to compete in the worlds, they might compete in the All Englands, they might compete in, in the American nationals before they ever compete in the worlds. So they're trying to find well, who, what's their competition like? You know, who do I have to beat? And that's kind of scary in some ways, but it means that people are really trying to develop the form in such a way, and it is very virtuosic with the feet now. <laughs> and it is about virtuosity to such an extent that people regard it as a sport and they don't really see it as part of culture anymore. A lot of people say it has nothing to do with Irish culture. This is a practice. Anybody can do it. And, uh, and we're going to develop it as a sport. We're going to train. We're going to exercise. They do their warm-ups, cool-downs, what we all do. But the thing is, it's about winning. And it's about how fast you are with your feet and how high you can bring your leg. And all these are what I call very measurable in competition. And that's kind of scary in some ways because I suppose, like yourself, having trained at that particular point in time, um, it can become very mechanical, you know? And the... the never got that far with me. No. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the humanity uh, to remain and grace and these other qualities that you have in the dance, that that's not lost um, along the way. But even for me, you know, the 1960s, 70s, I think the reason I could understand what these older guys were doing, because I was brought in because younger dancers in the area didn't understand what these older dancers were doing with their feet, which was very interesting. So, um, and I think part of the reason was as well, they didn't spend the time. You know, they looked, they decided it wasn't for them and they left. Whereas with me, I came in and I decided I was going to learn it. So I put my body through that. And after a while, you know, you pick up the steps and you dance the steps. Um, but even for me, the changes between when I started and finished, you know, is far less to what it is today. Today the changes are every year, every six months, every three months. And that's quite scary. And as you could, I wasn't able to show you a, a clip, 
where it's very elevated off the ground to suit younger bodies. Uh, because when the Commission took it over, it was really for young dancers, younger bodies, a term such as lift, move, came in. You know, legs up at the back, uh, the degree of the angle in front of your feet, uh, cuts, uh, kicking here. So all of this became important and it was associated with younger bodies. You wouldn't really have had that with the older dancers. Do you know, to them, it was about rhythm. It was about musicality. And it was about sounding out that rhythm and enjoying themselves as well. And another part of that tradition was the pride that they took in, in what they did and how they did it. So there was a kind of a, what I would call um, a dignity associated with it. They might have had hundreds of steps. Dancers today might have a lot more steps. They had less, but what they did with those steps was very creative and very uh, colorful, artistically speaking. Does that answer your question, Jordan? It's like any class today. You teach what a student can pick up, you know, according to the competence, the abilities of the student. You don't teach a student something that they can't do, you know? So it's very progressive like that. You teach them something, then the next week gets a little bit more difficult, the next week a little bit more difficult, and you're progressively and gradually developing the skill of the dancer. So Molno, for instance, when he was teaching the students, he taught women one thing, he taught men another thing. There was such a thing as masculine steps and feminine steps. <laughs> So in the masculine movements, you'd have a lot of uh, drums, women, <laughs> lots of toes and threes and stuff. So softer movements for the women, harder rhythmical movements did for the guys. Did he teach, the, did he teach them that, that it was an open form that they could play with themselves, or did he, did he just say, this he is how I do it, it's how you should mm. do it? He we might not be able to know that, of course. <laughs> he'd, so he'd have taught them a step. Yeah. And then after that, a step is an eight-bar structure. It's a choreographic structure, and eight bars of the accompanying music, which can either be reels, jigs, or hornpipes, OK? So what they did is he teach them a step, they go home and practice it. They come back, he give them another step. But they can't really create with that unless they have enough material yeah. to create with. It's like vocabulary. If you've got eight words, you can't do very much with the eight words. Whereas if you've got 60,000 words, you know, we could have a very interesting conversation. And it's the same with the dance. Do you know, you're limited if you've only got one step. Whereas if, you've get, if you get far more steps, then your ability to improvise, to create, is, is far more. You know, the chances are far greater. But to answer that question is, he created um, steps for the dancer's abilities. And whatever way he put those motifs and movements into those steps, and, and the way he felt on that day. Some days he might decide, I'm going to do this. Some days I'm going to do something else. But equally, these dancers went themselves. They watched other dancers performing. They saw other dancing um, neighbors performing. And they picked up what they liked. And they imitated. There was a lot of imitation going on. And they mightn't take it exactly, because you mightn't remember eight bars of a step when you look at it exactly. But you might remember three bars, do you know? And you might take two bars of that and put it into a st your own step. Or you might even take you know, half a bar or something of a movement you liked and you put it into your step. So it was constantly going on like that. They were constantly watching other dancers. They were constantly playing with the music as well. So you're talking about looking at other people performing, but you're also talking about in your own kitchen. <laughs> if there's music in your own kitchen, you will perform to that music. And depending on the musician, depending on the tune, you might do very different things. And especially in the social context, you know, how a fiddle, the phrasing, you know, the bow of the hand, the ornamentation, that'll affect you in what you do, and it might also affect the rhythmical patterns you create. In the moment. Well, in the well. moment, yes. And that brings me on, perhaps, to my second question, yeah. which is I wonder if you can talk a bit more about Shan Moss, because it mm. seems to me that, and I may be wrong in this mm. perception, that there's been a massive explosion Mm. in Shan Moss in mm. the last few decades. Yes. And mm. um, I'm wondering if you saw that as a, perhaps a foil for the, de the development of um, dance in the river dance way, where almost some people mm. see it to be un-Irish. Mm. And then the Shan Moss develops to really root it down into something mm. which is seen as much more mm. individual and... and, and um, it's, it's some people, 
well, I know what you mean. More natural Irish, if you like. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever natural Irish <laughs> is, exactly, I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> but when you look at uh, Shanos, I haven't shown Shanos means old style. And Shanos was a style of uh, step dancing. Again, it's performed solo. But there, Shanos wasn't taught by dancing masters. So it didn't have the repertoire that you had with dancing masters. You didn't have accumulation of steps in the reels, jigs and hornpipes. So most of the channels dances performed to real music and it was very uh, improvisational. So they might take a motif like, you know, so you might play with it that way. That's two motifs. So you might decide to do something different with it. But the point is in, in Shanos, it was regarded or was perceived as maybe being older, you know, that I had developed, as you were saying, organically <laughs> or naturally within the community, whereas river dance was seen as the trained dancing, and the dancers for river dance came out of the commission and these training schools within the commission. Shanos, because of its lack of training, was seen as older. It was seen as rural and quainter. And so now there are classes and competitions. Well now, <laughs> well, now there are, again, yeah, there are competitions again now in Shanos dancing. I've actually adjudicated <laughs> these competitions. <laughs> and, and there are workshops in Shanos dancing. And, and we can't go into this here, but the interesting thing is what is the impact of workshops on the dance form, which was regarded as improvisational and very individual, because they're all related in the sense you have competition, People will follow what wins in competition. Uh, they'll follow the style of dancing that wins in competition because people enter to win. That's the first thing. And then the other thing is these people who win will be asked to give workshops. So then you find people imitating these styles. So instead of finding unique individual styles, you find many people being clones of one individual style. And that was never what Shanos was about. Shanos was always about an individual style. And people who practice Shanos would say that. You know, it's about the individual, it's about you putting the mark on the dance yourself in. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.